This is The Baseline, discussing the hot button topics of the NBA. Welcome everybody, you're tuned to The Baseline, Cal Lee, Warren Shaw, discussing the hot button topics of the NBA. We are about a week or so away, give or take about two weeks away from NBA All-Star Weekend. Teams are getting amped up, the players are amping it up, some of them are actually putting a stamp on making their claim to be considered an NBA All-Star. Lucky thing for us, um, and maybe the players, we're not the ones who are going to be selecting them, but we will drive the narrative of whether or not they deserve to be in there because that is what we do here at the Baseline NBA Podcast. Let me go ahead and roll out the red carpet to my right-hand man, 50 Graham, my partner in crime, my brother like no other, www.shawsports.net, Big Kahuna PNC. My man, Warren Shaw, repping out of Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Holla back at me, Mr. Shaw. Yo, man, I got to ask you this question, bro. Um, are you fond of, of Tom Brady's hands? <laughs> Not going to touch it at all. <laughs> <laughs> no? Um, I, I, am, I am not a big fan of, of Tom Brady or his hands. Um, I recognize he is probably the, the greatest quarterback in NFL history and, and all of those things. I'm just not a Patriots fan. So, you know, kudos to them for making the Super Bowl. Um, but, yeah, not very excited about it, you know, as we do, as we record our show here, man. But, as always, salute to all the fans listeners of NBA Baseline. You know, we'll definitely be having some all-star conversation going on here. Um, and another topic of discussion that I think is going to be a little bit um, fun for us to kind of look back. I love to, you know, kind of reassess our, our initial opinions on things that happened in the NBA and kind of look back and see, okay, do we still have those same opinions now? So I think that breakdown segment is going to a little bit, be a little bit fun. Yeah, I, listen, um, buyer's remorse, right? Is I, I think is how you eloquently touted it on, on our outline, our outline notes of the show. Buyer's remorse are bang for your buck. We're going to take a look back on the trades that have taken place over the course of this offseason. And listen, we're legitimately at the halfway point, you know, regardless of where things kind of transpire, you know, by the time we get to All-Star Weekend, this is enough of a sample size for us to kind of look back at some of the major trades that have impacted, uh, you know, teams that we're, you know, clearly looking at right now. They're in the playoff taste, ch- teams that are str- striving to figure out their way as they're making their stake to the p- through the playoff chase. Buyer's remorse or bang for your buck. So we're going to look at some of those trades which I think is a really great uh, focal point uh, as we start getting closer to NBA All-Star Weekend and then looking beyond that, you know, as teams continue to make that push uh, for the NBA playoffs and getting themselves ready to try to hoist that O'Brien trophy. So good stuff all around. Once again, be sure to get at my man Shaw at Shaw Sports NBA. Get at me at Game Face Lee. Show's Twitter handle at NBA Baseline. We're available on all the major platforms. You know where we are and you know how we roll. So we always encourage you, Download any of the major platforms uh, to allow us to be your go-to resource discussing all things NBA. Uh, We're also exclusively featured on Potable, a new and upcoming platform that's out there. Uh, And we're also uh, featured on Dash Radio as well, too. So for a lot of you uh, listeners of not only sports, but also entertainment and music and things of that nature, we're right there in the mix as well, too. So don't veer too far off uh, from downloading us and catching a glimpse on all of the hot button topics discussed in the NBA by yours truly. You know how we do, and you know how we roll. It's time now for the breakdown. Time to break it down. Put you down put the bone gristle. Bone gristle, bone gristle. Time now for the breakdown. Cal Lee Warren Shaw of the Baseline NBA Podcast. And our topic for the breakdown this week, buyer's remorse or bang for your buck. We're looking at some of the trades Big trades, not the little itsy bitsy trades, not the you know, not the trades in which you got to go scrumming through whether or not they got waived two weeks after the trade was has happened or twenty four hours after the trade was happened, or whether or not they're playing for the G League. Not those kind of trades. We're talking about the trades of premier players who have been sent to another team, whether it's through speculation, whether it's through contractual negotiations, uh, whether it's the organizations just choosing to move in a different direction. You know, we're looking at these trades that are impacting both sides of the coin, the team that sent the player to and the team that has received the player from. So let's get right into it, Shaw, because this is really a good time for us to have this conversation when we look at some of the major trades that happened in this past offseason. The first one that sticks out in our, in our minds is the trade from the, the Minnesota Timberwolves and the Chicago Bulls, and this one involving Jimmy Butler for Zach Levine, Chris Dunn, and uh, the 14th pick in the NBA draft. 
Shaw, I'm going to start with you. Buyer's remorse or bang for your buck? And on which side are we talking about that for? Uh, this is a this is a, a put. I think everybody feels like they got banged for their buck here. Um, both situations for for these two rosters have worked out marvelously. <laughs> you know, I mean, really and truly, for where Minnesota wanted to go and take their team, uh, they needed to have a, a veteran guy, an All Star level guy like Jimmy Butler, come on their roster and help push some of the young guys on that team just who hadn't been able to taste success yet. And then for the Chicago standpoint, getting the building blocks that they've gotten. Um, I think and Chris Dunn and Zach Levine, who's just still working his way back from injury right now, as we, as we obviously as we record. But then that 14th pick turning out to be Laurie Markkinen, uh, a guy who's basically going to make Nikola Mirotic and Bobby Portis maybe useless, if you will, for for the rest of this roster. To me, this is a trade that that everybody got what they wanted to get out of it. Chicago, from a rebuilding standpoint, got two, well, three pieces for them to be a part of this future. And then for the Timberwolves, who wanted to make the playoffs immediately, right now sitting fourth in the Western Conference, Jimmy Butler has been immense for what Minnesota has been trying to do. So both teams feel like they got banged for their buck. I like how you worded this whole scenario right now when we look at the Chicago Bulls and the Minnesota Timberwolves. On the, on the first side of it regarding the Minnesota Timberwolves, and you use a very interesting phrase here, Shaw, an all-star level type of guy. Because when you look at the numbers of what Jimmy Butler is showing you right now, he probably would be considered an all-star in the Eastern Conference more so than what we see his numbers reflect in the Western Conference. In the Western Conference, it almost feels like they're somewhat of pedestrian numbers just simply because of the magnitude of talent that is in the Western Conference. If he's on a standalone team and next around some adequate talent, and we're talking about the Chicago Bulls being competitive in the Eastern Conference playoff picture, these would be considered all-star type numbers. 21.7 points per game, 5.4 rebounds, 5.5 uh, assists on shooting, a 47% shooting. These are career numbers. And he's elevating a Minnesota Timberwolves team that has struggled to figure out how good they truly are because they have talent, they just don't know how to win. He's elevated them to being a top four team in the Western Conference. So by all stretch of the imagination, the Minnesota Timberwolves are getting more than what they've expected. A veteran leader, a guy, to your point, all-star level type of guy, but someone who is not detracting from the all-star caliber play of guys like Wiggins and the Big Cat. And it's all symbiotic, and they're now a top four team. You look at the Chicago Bulls. I can't believe I'm saying that the Chicago Bulls are definitely getting bang for their buck. They have a guy in Chris Dunn who, for whatever reason, the Minnesota Timberwolves certainly were just not sold on, even though they hyped him up as being that guy that they selected in the draft. This guy is coming in and instantly showing you why, under all circumstances, if the Timberwolves didn't have all the talent that they have on their roster, we could be sitting here wondering about what were the Minnesota Timberwolves thinking by not moving Ricky Rubio and giving this guy, Chris Dunn, an opportunity to play. And since he's now got this opportunity for Chicago, he is almost helping to solve the problem that the Chicago Bulls have incrementally have had every single year beyond Derrick Rose, is figuring out how to have a steady point guard to help navigate this basketball team, show him emotional leadership, showing him emotional play. He, you're getting that from a guy like Chris Dunn, who I believe has got a lot to play for. And then you look at Laurie Markinen, to your point, Shaw, this guy is lights out coming in, and he's basically proving that somehow, someway, the Chicago Bulls talent and scouts and their organization understood what they were doing when they made this trade. Like, it's almost making Jim Paxson look like a freaking superstar general manager, right? We're not going to go that far, but what we're talking about is the Chicago Bulls look good in this. And then we don't even know about Zach Levine because Zach Levine hasn't even had enough games under his plate to tell us where he fits in the fold of the future of the Chicago Bulls. Clearly, it's by the marking of the trade and his profile as being an elite athlete. But as far as him being the shooting guard of the future and everything like that, that is yet to really pan itself out. We'll see how this, the season plays along. But all of this looks so good for the Chicago Bulls. And this clearly could have been a situation where in the beginning of the season, we were talking about this could be buyer's remorse for the Chicago Bulls. Yeah, you're right. We really could have been looking at it from, from that standpoint, especially with Dunn starting the season on the shelf as well as Levine, again, who just, just came back. 
Markkinen end up ends up getting to start because Miritich and Poros get into the scuffle that they had and then just hasn't looked back. Like you really thought, okay, he's going to be a placeholder in that power forward position as a rookie. Um, but he's held on, man, at 15 and a half points, seven and a half rebounds, you know, over a hundred threes at this point of the stage of the season already as well, too. Uh, they, they have no reason to not give him all the minutes he can handle. And then Dunn came back, took a little while to kind of get into his zone a little bit. Uh, but he just needed the opportunity to, to go out there and not be pulled if he made any mistakes. And just by default, because there are no other real point guards on this roster, with all respect to Jerry and Grant and, you know, whoever the other guys are on that team, uh, to, to me, it really feels like Dunn has, just understands his role, his, his opportunity. And again, you know, what you said about Levine is, is, is interesting because they, they firmly believe in Zach Levine. And although they did not get a deal done, they didn't trade Jimmy Butler. Uh, to let Levine walk, you know, this summer, like they're going to, you know, give whatever they, what they, what they can for him. But obviously with the injury that made things a little bit problematic, trying to negotiate a salary, but he's very much a part of what they're going to be trying to do. And if he can get all the way back and again, maybe that's not even this year. Again, he just could try to get his legs back this year. Uh, but I think he's going to be, you know, showing that balance and showing that electricity that we know him before. A guy was a 20 point per game guy last year in Minnesota, you know, with Towns and Wiggins on that roster. So, you know, you go to the Chicago team now, you, once he gets right, he should go right back into that range, if, if, if you ask me. And I think, again, both teams very excited about their futures. Before we move on to the next one, Shaw, I'm just curious. Now when you look at this, the, the, the talent for the Chicago Bulls, Denzel Valentine, um, the play of, of Justin Holliday has you know, clearly been remarkable. I, to me, I, I find it very funny that you know no team has really settled themselves on a guy like Justin Holliday. But you have all of this talent. How much of the focal point now is – on Fred Hoiberg to harness this talent and get these guys to continue to improve in order for him to keep his job as the head coach? Or do you see that because of what we're seeing transpire with this basketball team, and clearly there's some roster moves that have to be that have to happen, some players need to be purged from this roster before we clearly see it moving forward. Do you see it with Fred Hoiberg at the helm as the head coach? Right now, yeah. I don't, I don't think he's in any danger. I think there was some trepidation for a little while, but I think he's, he's kind of skated past that. Um, and again, with the team and the front office primarily finally making a decision like, all right, we are going to rebuild. We're not going to try to force, you know, these, these square parts, if you will, together and, and just try to mash it together and hope it worked like they did with Rondo, Wade, and Butler last year. They want to rebuild. Hoiberg seems to be okay with that. And under, now he can implement his style of kind of playing a little bit faster um, and, you know, having some young athletic guys on this team. So as you alluded to, still some moves to make. You know, they got to trim some of the, the veteran fat, if you will, on this roster. I don't think Lopez is going to be a part of it. Obviously, we've talked about Miritich being involved in a, a ton of trade rumors. So uh, they'll figure that part out. And whatever they end up getting back for one or both of those guys, you know, see what those parts also look like going forward for the future. All right, but yeah. again, Chicago, sorry, sorry, but Chicago's in good shape. And just to close with Minnesota, um, I, I really think Jimmy Butler is going to, to really uh, push them when it comes to the playoff situation. So that's why that worked out for everybody. All right, you're tuned to The Baseline. Cal Lee, Warren Shaw, discussing the hot-button topics of the NBA. Topic of conversation on the breakdown. Buyer's remorse or bang for your buck? The big trades in the offseason, how have they panned out for each of the respective teams? Let's go ahead and focus our attention to one of the major offseason moves that kind of shook people up. Maybe not so much about the player themselves, but the destination of where the players went to. So here you have a scenario with the Indiana Pacers and a player like Paul George, disgruntled, uh, clearly has shown no sign that he wanted to re-sign with the Indiana Pacers, that he has aspirations of possibly going to the Los Angeles Lakers if he could possibly move. And of all the destinations that he winds up going to, it's with a team that we weren't really anticipating uh, that we're going to try to make a play for this guy. It's such a magnitude in, in the way that they did. So here you have the Indiana Pacers moving Paul George to the Oklahoma City Thunder. For Victor Oladipo, who was just removed from his play with the Orlando Magic, played one season next to Russell Westbrook, and then they also gave up their first-round draft pick, DeMontis Sabonis. Buyer's remorse, bang for your buck, Oklahoma City, Indiana Pacers, Shaw. This one's a little unique. Um, like, I don't know if the jury is completely out for OKC. Um they're in a situation because George is so, for lack of a better phrase, flamboyant about being non-committal. <laughs> you know, he's very, very consistent in that. He's like, oh, well, we'll see. And, you know, so if OKC isn't able to retain Paul George's services at the end of this, then they're going to have buyer's remorse. 
I think right now they're like they're okay with what they've done. Oladipo and Sabonis weren't working together um, as a trio with Westbrook for whatever reason. So I think OKC is kind of just like, all right, well, we got to still wait a little bit. Um, but I, I I don't know if they have quite buyers or more because of the players that they gave up. It just wasn't really working. And the, and obviously in the case of Indiana, I mean, raw statistic-wise, Oladipo is having a better season than Paul George. Raw statistics. You know, it was 25 a game, five rebounds, five assists. Like, it's it's pretty absurd what, what Oladipo is doing now with, with the amount of efficiency. And Sabonis has just been a godsend for them. You know, playing a lot of minutes in Indiana with Miles Turner being being injured as much as he has been this season. Um, and then even while when Turner was there, you know, almost a double-double type guy, you know, when he gets his, like, 30-plus minutes or so. Uh, I really feel like Indiana, we were all wrong. Uh, and I mean, to a man, we were all wrong that Indiana got robbed on this. They, they've come out well ahead. Obviously, you couldn't have predicted that Victor Oladipo was going to take this type of leap and become my most improved type player, you know, in this season. Uh, but nevertheless, and most improved and maybe even an all-star. Uh, but Indiana is in great shape now with, with Oladipo and Sabonis. And, and again, actually in the playoff hunt as a result of those two guys. All right. I'm going to – it's interesting because – Part of my explanation to where buyer's remorse lies with the Oklahoma City Thunder, I think, will happen when we talk about the next trade, which is the Carmelo Anthony trade, right? We'll break that down in depth in a moment. But I'm almost at the point, Shaw, where I'm going to come to you and say, pick your poison. Because here's where my, here's where my thought process lies on this. It's buyer's remorse if you're going to tell me that you are going to win a championship which is ultimately the reason why Sam Presti did what he did. He, he's trying to prove to Russell Westbrook, we will do what's necessary, one, to keep you, and number two, um, to give you whatever it is you feel is necessary to get you to the promised land, okay? So my thing is, pick your poison about what will be considered buyer's remorse, right? Having Paul George or having Carmelo Anthony, but you can't have both because I don't think that this three that represents OK3 is capable of winning an NBA championship. Not that I don't think that these guys are not talented enough to do it. I just don't know if the temperament and the ball is accessible for all three of these guys when it matters the most. Now, they look a hell of a lot better than what they've reflected the beginning part of this season. But to your point, Shaw, when I look at Paul George and I look at what he's giving the Oklahoma City Thunder, Part of where my buyer's remorse lies is in the fact that it's the same thing that I didn't see translate from Paul George when he was with the Indiana Pacers post his knee injury after the two appearances going to the Eastern Conference Finals playing against the Miami Heat. Something with Paul George is lost. And if you're going to tell me that you're going to push all your chips in the, in, in the center of the table, if you're the Oklahoma City Thunder and bringing a guy like this to play next to Russell Westbrook, you are undoubtedly saying that all of that emotional leadership, that drive, that willingness to, to take this team to that next level is going to fall on Russell Westbrook's shoulders and now no accountability will ever be given to a guy like Paul George. And if you're going to play it like that, I'm completely fine with it. But the reason why the Indiana Pacers are getting the bang for their buck is because, one, you got a guy like Victor Oladipo that seems like he wants it. And I agree with you. From man to man, we didn't think that Oladipo had it in him as of yet. Maybe it would be another year down the road, whatever. And then to get a guy like DeMontis Sabonis. And I've said this, Shaw. I had this epiphany, calpiphany, if you will. Doesn't DeMontis Sabonis playing for Indiana remind you like of another guy that was part of that glue that, that helped the Indiana Pacers be one of the, the, the stalwarts in that central division? A guy like Detlef Strength, where his athleticism is sneaky good, his shooting is off the metrics, and then there's these other things that he brings to the table that help supplement the game of the guys like the Reggie Millers and the Antonio and Dale Davises of, the, of that team. You're getting that with DeMontis Sabonis. And when you're telling me that this is an Indiana Pacers team that is rebuilding, you can't tell me that rebuilding with a player like that, that nobody is talking about, because everyone's still focused on Oladipo, won't be beneficial, especially if you're in the playoff hunt in the Eastern Conference. Right. Yeah, I agree. I think Sabonis is definitely giving them all the, the glue they can possibly need off of that bench and, and providing them with that sneaky toughness. And I, again, I had an opportunity to speak with him earlier in the season and he said he worked on everything. And 
he and Oladipo both say just playing with Westbrook changed their mentality. You know, so to some degree, the Brody has a lot of is, is has a lot of influence on how good the paces are now. Uh, those two guys just they saw what it was if they wanted to take that next step and 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 try to become great NBA players, and they worked hard in the off season. Um, and, and again, I I just I I'm not trying to knock Kevin Pritchard and the Pacers. I just don't know that they knew that these guys would come here and be this good. I feel like I still feel like they settled a little bit. But it's one of those things, man, it really worked out. You know, it really worked out for them. Um, and in the case of OKC, yeah, it, it's it's very, very shaky right now putting the, the trio together with PG and Carmelo and Russ there because um, it, it's, again, it's it's borne some, you know, some interesting fruit thus far. And it's still it's still a t- story that needs to be determined. Uh, so, OK, and, and so, all right, so let's go ahead and let's add the, the Carmelo Anthony trade into this conversation for a moment, because I think you see where I'm coming from. Right. Like it feels like Russell Westbrook has infected these well-driven players like Victor Oladipo, DeMontis Sabonis. And then look, the New York Knicks, for all we were talking about, felt like they needed to figure out a way to get Carmelo Anthony just out of New York, period, right? And for their worth, and I was one of the people who was criticizing this trade, they gave up, um, the the Oklahoma City Thunder gave up Enos Cantor, Doug McDermott, and a second-round pick for Carmelo Anthony, okay? Now, if I'm putting all of this into the equation, do we not have the same conversation about a guy like Enos Cantor and what he's been doing for the New York Knicks and what Doug McDermott is helping the New York Knicks do? And they also get a draft pick and what Carmelo Anthony has been giving the Oklahoma City Thunder. So now it all brings us in full circle, Shaw. If we were to put, put both of these elements in together, both of these trades in it together, is there a, a legitimate level of buyer's remorse? Or is there a legitimate level of bang for your buck on both sides? Yeah, I, I think with I'll start with the Knicks. It's definitely addition by subtraction. You know, there's there's no doubt about it. Not that Carmelo didn't love to be in New York. All that's been you know highly touted and discussed everywhere possible. Um, but this is a situation where they just needed to go ahead and make some room for 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 Przingis to be the guy, um, and then for you know some of these other young players to 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 get their touches as well too. And I think the result has. Has been pretty good for New York this year, um, fighting for a playoff spot. Porzingis started off the season like a man on a complete mission. Um, yes, he's tailed off. And he's off still going to wind bit, up being an, he, he may very well be an all star. All, all signs are pointing at he, and we'll talk about that in our reserves conversation on the drop. But Porzingis is is playing at an all star level, right? Yeah. So that that needed to happen. That's just it's just what it is. And you know we were very skeptical, I think, about the addition of Cantor because they had. Noah and, and O'Quinn and Hernan Gomez, who they seemed like they were very high on last year, and we're going to need to give some minutes. But um, all that stuff is it's kind of gone by the wayside. It can't, it's Cantor's job. Like, he's the man there, you know, and he puts up some crazy numbers at times, especially on the offensive class, as, as he's known to do, and, and, they're, and they're fine with it. McDermott hasn't quite had the impact that they would have liked. But, again, for the Knicks overall, although the players themselves haven't been amazing, and, again, with the exception of Cantor's had some special moments, Definitely addition by subtraction. So, you know, they're, they're bang for the buck. They're getting rid of Carmelo. Um, and, and I think it's much the same in, as the case in Paul George for, for OKC. Um, Melo's going to opt in. So they're pretty much going to be stuck with him for another year. Uh, so, I, I, you know, it's, I, I don't want to say buyer's remorse per se. I just feel like they wish they got a, they've gotten a little bit more. But there's still some time to be had. And, you know, we'll see what happens in the playoffs when these three veterans try to put their heads together. You're turned to the baseline. Callie Warren Shaw discussing the hot button topics of the NBA, our segment of the breakdown. Buyer's remorse are bang for your buck. The big trades have taken place this offseason. We talk about how that's progressed for each of the respective teams. All right, Shaw, let's go ahead and talk about the trade that is really making a lot of noise in the Western Conference. The Los Angeles Clippers moving Chris Paul to the Houston Rockets for virtually three-fourths of the Houston Rockets roster. Okay, and a protective first round pick uh, for next year. Right. And some cash while you while you add it. Cash rules everything around them. Cream, get the money, dollar, dollar bill clippers. Right. Okay, so it's very safe to say there's no buyer's remorse whatsoever in Houston. All right. So I don't even want you to even delve in on that. What I want you to tell me is there buyer's remorse with the Los Angeles Clippers. No, none at all. Um, I, I don't and I don't know if it's bank for your buck either is it's just a situation where what else were they going to do chris paul wanted to leave so he could have left for nothing or <laughs> you could have gotten what you got him back um and, and in some so, some cases you know i think they are happy with it especially in the case of lou williams who's playing the best basketball of his entire nba career 
and there's a chance they may move him. So if they move Lou Williams and then get something back, another late first rounder, although that might be lofty expectations per se, um, if they if they move him and get something back in in return, you know, then they've turned Chris Paul into you know potentially two first round picks. You know, in addition to Montrezl Harrell and Sam Decker and DeAndre Liggins and Pat Beverly and things of that nature, and Beverly obviously will be back next season. Uh, so I think for for the Clippers, they did the best they could given the situation that Chris Paul kind of put them in, saying that he wanted to leave and that he wanted to go to Houston. So you know what? I'll even flip flop a little bit. I will say that you know they did get banged for their buck because they made the best out of a of a bad situation. I'll give you credit for saying that the Clippers did get banged for their buck because of how you highlighted what Lou Williams has been doing so far this year, which I do think partly because of what's happened to Patrick Beverly. So it's almost as if it was a saving grace play, so to speak, and throwing in a guy like Lou Williams into this deal. Um, Because I don't know how Lou Williams really would have factored uh, when you look at how Doc Rivers plays plays guys. Like, I know that that's his Jamal Crawford because Jamal Crawford it was no longer with that team. I just, I just don't know the dynamics of when you see how Rivers utilizes his players how effective Lou Williams truly would have been and maybe would have been revisiting this and saying there's a possibility of buyer's remorse because Lou Williams' play has been hampered playing under Doc Rivers and the Los Angeles Clippers. But saving grace again, Lou Williams is the man, right? Where this kind of throws me is more so about the value of the picks. If the Houston Rockets make the run that I think that they're banking Chris Paul will give James Harden, okay, and, and and maybe it's not so much this year as just over the course of what this team is going to look like over the next couple of years. I will not have a problem with the idea that the Houston Rockets gave up first-round pick. Cash really doesn't matter to me. What matters to me is what the Clippers do with the pick and what the Clippers do with the players that they have, the Montrell Zarrells and the Sam Deckers, because I believe that those are guys that can really be utilized and can help a team like the Los Angeles Clippers. But when you got a coach like Doc Rivers, and we've had guys on our show before who've talked about this, kind of suspect on the way he uses his players, the way he implements role players and how they will contribute. It's forced upon him because of all the excessive injuries. But I don't know if he's true to that, and it'll be interesting to see how and which players actually survive, <laughs> call it survivor's remorse, Shaw, with the Los Angeles Clippers to make this deal look like it's legitimate on both sides. I think that's a valid point, especially in the case of a guy like Decker, who I would just would have figured would be getting more minutes, especially now that Gallo has been out, you know, three-fourths of the season. Exactly. Um, the, the fact that Decker's still not getting a whole lot of run, I don't know if that says more about Decker than it does about Doc or, or vice versa. Um, but something is just not right there. Harrell has seemed to get, starting to get his stride now that DeAndre has been hurt with his, with the ankle injury a little bit. Um, but again, has, has always been an energy guy when he gets him in, especially interesting. He was really doing his thing. So those guy, those pieces, um, I don't want to say they're there to stay because they obviously could be moved in, in an instant if, they're, if, if things became available. Uh, but those are nice rotation pieces that you can kind of plug and play and use use them if if Doc were to so choose. Again, I'll just go back to the fact that Beverly is a, is a guy who they intend to keep there um, and, and really solidify their defense moving forward. Um, but if they trade Lou Williams and get, a, again, something nice for Lou Williams um, this season or next, however it works out, then this deal becomes even a little bit more sweeter because they would have essentially turned Chris Paul into two two potential picks and some nice rotation players. All right, Sean, let's go ahead and round out this conversation uh, with the trade that I'm sure has shook up the whole Eastern Conference by de facto law, and that's the Kyrie Irving trade uh, with the Cleveland Cavaliers. First of all, Shaw, it, 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 it boggled my mind to see that the Cleveland Cavaliers would be willing to give up one of their star players to a team that they wound up playing against in the Eastern Conference. But by all accounts, let's just assume for the sake of argument that we're talking about the, the quality of the type of trade that was given. So Kyrie Irving gets moved from the Cleveland Cavaliers to the Boston Celtics for Isaiah Thomas, Jay Crowder, Ante Cisic, and the Brooklyn's and a Brook and one of the Brooklyn uh, Nets uh, Celtics Nets trade uh, first round draft picks. Right? Buyer's remorse or bang for the buck. Yeah, it's it's bang for the buck. I think for Boston currently, um, Isaiah. Yeah, he was hurt. So you know, does this have the same value uh, when we're talking in April and May? You know, we, we'll we'll see um, because Cleveland might have had. Uh, 
with IT being there and then potentially with that first round pick for Brooklyn, whether they decide to keep it now, it's a bargaining chip, right? So if they move that by the trade deadline and get a DeAndre or get somebody else in there as a result of it, um, it really becomes a win-win for, for both teams, given, again, the situations that they were put into. I think for Boston, it was a, it was very risky, very risky for them to, to make this move, um, trading a guy who was a top five MVP candidate, trading a number one pick, um, you know, from Brooklyn, who's, you know, obviously not a very good basketball team, but to Dan Ainge's credit, has been better than most people thought they would have been this year. Um, so that Brooklyn doesn't look like the worst team in the league right now. That honor belongs to the Atlanta Hawks. So I think in in that regard, Cleveland and, and Boston both did what they had to do given the situation, similar to what happened with the Clippers and the Houston Rockets. Um, but I think Boston is clearly winning that trade right now. So they definitely feel like they've gotten the bang for their buck while the Cleveland Cavaliers are still assessing options. And if they move that first round pick, as I alluded to, then, you know, it depends what they get back for. It, and then we'll see what side of the trade they end up being on. Bang for your bang for the buck if you're the Boston Celtics, right? Double bang. I'm I'm talking DDP Diamond Dallas Page bang. I mean porn star bang. All right, for the buck right now for the Boston Celtics to get what what you got because it's twofold, Shaw. Let's keep in mind too the Boston Celtics just basically ripped a dynasty from the Cleveland Cavaliers. Now I'm not saying that the Cleveland Cavaliers are booney foo foo the fool for pulling off this deal. Okay, clearly. They thought that by giving up Kyrie Irving and getting back Isaiah Thomas and Jay Crowder, which is two-fifths of the starting rotation of the team you played against in the Eastern Conference Finals, it balances out the fact that as long as we have King James, that this basketball team would somehow make up for the loss of that. But again, I just revert back to the idea of when you do things like this, what does that say about your organization? What does that say about your team? and your reliance on doing things that are so unconventional. If it's not you, then don't do it, okay? And I get it. The draft pick is is mighty tempting. You know what I'm saying? No matter how you slice it. But you're not getting what you're getting out of Jay Crowder that Jay Crowder gave the Boston Celtics, not because he's tanking it or nothing. Isaiah Thomas is still not 100%. And by all stretch of the imagination, I think this team was really impacted by losing Kyrie Irving. Not that this isn't LeBron James's team, but just by the simple fact that it's so easy that these things can happen when you got a good thing going. Now, a team like the Boston Celtics may not have to suffer from that because they've been playing this game for the last three years. So to me, I just think that there's certainly buyer's remorse if you're the Cleveland Cavaliers, because unless all this means you win a championship, you cannot equate to me the diminished the diminished um, returns of taking apart one of the best tandems, duos, in the NBA. Well, you're right, you know, but I will say this, I think with the Cleveland Cavaliers, Crowder hasn't quite been the same Crowder. Um, You know, he hasn't quite found the role and the niche that he had in Boston um, with Cleveland Cavaliers right now. And I think it's hard sometimes for wing guys specifically to play, play alongside LeBron James. So Crowder is... He's just not as involved in the offense. He doesn't you know, really handle the ball anyway, but spotting up isn't really just, okay, he's just going to sit in the corner and wait for, for the ball to come to him. So in that regard, you know, Cleveland hasn't gotten everything that they wanted out of it. And in the case of Zizek, you know, he's just really been, you know, going to, what is it, the Canton charge or whatever their dirty league official is, officiate is. So they haven't really gotten everything they, they've wanted to out of the other players um, that they got from for, for Boston. Again, Isaiah's still working his way back and think he's going to obviously, he'll be fine. But really the key to this, is our first round draft pick, you know, and, and what they decide to do with it, um, especially if they move it before the trade deadline. All right, man. Well, there you have it. A lot of bang for the buck with these trades, man. I'm a little surprised, man. No buyer's remorse. I think next time, man, I I, I need to, to dig a little bit harder, man. Make sure that there's some level of remorse. I want I want organizations crying. I want them weeping. You know what I'm saying? Over well, if some we of do these if we do another segment, <laughs> you know, where we do some of the free agent signings, I think there is some some buyer's remorse there. So the trades all seem to have worked out for the most part, but I think there are some free agent signings that some teams are like, damn, I wish I didn't give up that give up that bag of money. To this player but you know what we're stuck in that position for right now so you know we'll see what happens maybe throw that in there for next week all right well that sounds good to me you're tuned to the baseline cal lee warren shaw discussing the hot button topics of the nba and this was the breakdown <laughs> time now for the drop cal lee warren shaw the baseline nba podcast and this week on the drop 
Listen, man, NBA All-Star Weekend is coming soon. We have the NBA All-Star starter, uh, excuse me, starting lineup. Pardon my, pardon my uh, uh, non-verbal linguistically challenged self. But we have one other little nugget to have to sort out. And maybe this is exactly what we want to have happen as we start nearing ourselves to the NBA All-Star Weekend. Because it always seems to be this part of the conversation that makes us say, man, do we need to continue to change the rules of how we vote for the starters and for the reserves? And it's, of course, that's what it is. It's about the reserves, right, y'all? I mean, when you look at it, I think everyone can see within a 41-game, you know, scope who exactly should be the starters are. It's the reserves that always seems to be the problem uh, because somebody's going to get snubbed, right? So we're going to try and figure it out as best as we can. We can't, we can't all campaign for every single player that deserves to be in there, but we will try our best to give our assessment of who deserves to be all-star reserves in both the East and Western Conference. So let's start with the Eastern Conference, Shaw. Who do you have slated as your Eastern Conference reserves? All right, my dude. So we have got to pick you know, uh, two guards and three forwards, right? Or three front court players. Um, and then we have to pick two kind of First, wall it's cards funny that you said two guards and then, and then you said, uh, you know, three front court players. It's almost as if, you know, when we say two back court players, they can only be guards, right? Well, um, you know, e- e- I think in the West, it becomes different because right. certain guys, they're swing men. So it's like, do you count them as the guard or the And they just swing. I don't know. They, they, they're just swinging. Just yeah. letting it all hang in the wind, baby. Just let it swing. All right. Well, go ahead. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to touch that. All right. So, uh, <laughs> Uh, I think the first person that I'd pick, you know, and again, I've obviously been screaming from from the mountaintops. You know, this guy's been amazing this year. I've talked about him on the show already. Uh, Victor Oladipo would be my first reserve for the Eastern Conference. So that fills one of my guard spots. No reason to go into it. 24, 5, and 4, two steals a game. Stupid, stupid numbers, right? Um, I go with the second guard spot, and I'm going to go with Bradley Beal. Um, you know, I just think he's been very consistent for the Washington Wizards, obviously with Wall being out as much as he has been. Um, the Wizards have been able to tread water, you know, and still hold a playoff spot, if you will. And a lot of that is directly the result of Beal. Porter's been having some issues. Um, Marquise Morris started the, 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 the season injured and has been in and out of the lineup. Gortat hasn't been consistent, you know, the whole night. So Beal has been their MVP for sure. Um, and then in my front court, here's where it gets very interesting because I know for sure uh, coaches are going to give Al Horford a nod here. And I, I'm not necessarily knocking that, um, you know, but his numbers across the board aren't as flashy as some of the other all-stars, is, but what he does for his team and his roster. So Horford's going to make, you know, my uh, my front court list here. Um, Porzingis uh, is, is, is an interesting pick. I think he's he's going to make it simply because of, of what he's done for the Knicks and the fact that they're fighting for the playoff spot. And then I think Kevin Love is actually going to make it as well, too, and deserves to make it uh, for holding it down for the Cavaliers, despite the rocky start that they've, or rocky, rocky things that they've been going through recently. So that's five. So that gives me two more spots to go with. And I'm going to go with Kyle Lowry, and I'm going to go with – I'm stuck because it's either between Andre Drummond or I feel like you have to have a Heat representative there. Um, and, and the Heat representative, because they're such an even team, it just kind of defaults to Goran Dragic. And, and, and I'm not as comfortable with that as I would be picking, picking Andre Drummond. Um, but, you know, to go in the, in the what I think the coaches are going to do, I think they're going to reward winning and Dragic will be the nod. But I would probably edge a little bit more towards Andre Drummond if it was my vote. Wow. So you're not even thinking Hassan Whiteside, 14 and 11. No, no he's missed, nine. missed too many games. OK, missed too many. Games. And so in, 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 in essence, the way you're looking at this as well, too, is you're also um, holding that against John Wall from being a part of this all star roster. Correct. Correct. Hmm. Yep. Yeah, I, I'm really, I'm really looking at it as, I mean, I know the fans vote and what the fans want to see or who are the most exciting players in the league. And in that regard, then yeah, I mean, Wall makes that 100 times out of 100, you know, especially from the Eastern Conference. Um, but again, if I'm looking at it fairly, which is just what I do as an analyst, you know, I'm saying, okay, who deserves to be an all-star this year? And, and what have they done? And, and, and how does it, how they impact their team? Um, and, and that team, and that, that team should have representation on the NBA's quote unquote, one of the NBA's biggest stages, if you will, in All-Star Weekend. So, you know, rewarding winning is kind of what coaches tend to do. And that's why guys like Dragic and Horford, who aren't necessarily sexy picks, um, are probably going to make the roster. 
Well, and I think the, the the other thing that you would also have to look at as well is that if Kyrie Irving was still playing for the Cleveland Cavaliers, we'd be talking about the Cleveland Cavaliers essentially having still two players that would wind up being a part of the all-star roster, right? Um, if the Boston Celtics are the number one team in the Eastern Conference, and I'm not saying that this is how you should do it, but just logically thinking, though, if there is a player who in their position have numbers that are as comparable to some, to what the other guys are kind of doing, I, I just feel like he is going to wind up having to – he's going to wind up being in that talks. He's going to wind up being in the, in that consideration. If you're able to give the Atlanta Hawks at the time when they were stupid good, like they were completely – um, you know, overachieving. You could put four in, on 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 in the Eastern Conference All Star roster. I, I can't see why there should be a struggle to put at least two Boston Celtics on there. But I do find it interesting, Shaw, that you don't have Whiteside in that conversation. But it's true to your point. Hey, it matters when you're not playing games. So his numbers are truncated because of the fact that while he's come in and had these numbers and they're nice and they're impactful, they're only within a short number of games. Kudos to you, Shaw. Holding it down. Keeping it true to form. Old school. I like that. All right, let's go ahead and switch our attention to the Western Conference Reserves. Uh, before we do that, though, Shaw, I'm going to ask you this question. Are you going to finally, are, are you going to, are you going to let, are you going to let Dame Dollar, you know what I'm saying, get on the mic? Are you going to get him some shine? You know what I'm saying? Or are you going to treat him like eight mile? I, I got to know, bro. Oh. I got to know. Talk to me now. Talk to me. I, I had to put you on the spot instantly. What are we talking about with Dame Dollar, dog? Yeah, this is very hard for me. Oh, very, you are. Oh, listen, man, you already, <laughs> you already sound, and you already sounded like a politician with this, man. I'm not. I don't know where this is going, man. This ain't good, man. Well, I mean, you know, I'll, I'll go ahead and I think Dame would be my wild card and like literally in my last <laughs> wild card spot um, because what I don't. Don't let him ca- what hey, I man, don't, have. don't 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 let him put you on his next album. <laughs> He'll hit well, you. I, don't, again, let him, I, don't let him put you on that on, on don't let him put you on that uh, that black thought freestyle on sway, man. <laughs> you catch a bad one, bro. That was that was pretty ill. Yeah, I don't want to catch <laughs> okay. I don't catch no heat like that. I don't I don't want no smoke. But real talk though, you know, with with Dame, uh, it's kind of a similar situation here, right? We're talking about teams, and you want to kind of re- at least try to reward winning. So. They're right in the thick of it in the middle of the Western Conference. You know, I think six seed in the game behind for OKC as we record. So as the voting takes place, is kind of where they'll finish. So Dame probably is definitely going to get in there. Um, so, but you know, that's my wild card. I'll go back up a little bit. You know, um, where I have the two guards, uh, you're doing it wrong if you're not. <laughs> Westbrook isn't the first person that you're picking as a reserve. So I think that's that's a safe pick. Um, and then here's where it gets interesting because then it's like, all right, well, do you consider Butler, Jimmy Butler, the two or the three? Um, in Minnesota, I'm going to count him as a guard for 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 situational purposes here, um, and, and to give him that nod because Minnesota has been so good. And, and you know, going to the front court, um, Lamarcus Aldridge has been amazing, amazing for the San Antonio Spurs. Um, so he has to get a nod. Uh, Carl Anthony Towns, I think, is going to get a nod as well too. And then here's where I get um, a little bit uh, confused <laughs> as to what I would want to do um, because. The Nuggets and the Clippers are right there battling for playoff spots. But DeAndre and DeAndre is in a very strange situation, too. Just don't think he's quite all-star worthy. Blake has missed so much time. Then it boils down to, do I want to go ahead and give it to Jokic um, at, at, at that other forward or, sorry, at that other front court position? And that's where I'm going to actually give my nod. My biggest snub is going to be Draymond Green here, a guy who's averaging pretty much 11-7-7. and um, But I just don't think he's been the same player um, that we're used to. And again, even though averaging career high in assists, I don't know that the Warriors are going to need four all-stars on this roster again this he's, year. He's and not been the same, again, but he's not been the same player, Sean. More importantly, I, I just feel like there's something to be said again about oversaturating the all-star weekend with, how do I put it? Subpar, subpar numbers. Draymond Green is right. not is not like and this is again this is going to make me want to question how we go about all-star selections. Is it for the purposes of the game or is it for the purposes of the worthiness of their play through the course of an NBA half of a season? Um by all accounts we could say that Draymond Green's numbers are pretty much Draymond Green's numbers. It's just that there's been nothing impactful because 
the play has been startlingly better when it's Kevin Durant and it's Steph Curry and sometimes even even Klay Thompson. But even Klay Thompson is not even getting considerations to be on his All Star roster, right? Right, right. Well, I mean, and, and that's where it boils down to because I think that I think coaches picking the reserves, they're probably going to try to reward that. So Clay and Draymond are probably going to get consideration here, um, but I I just can't see taking both of them. So for me, it's one or the other. I just I just can't take both. And it was much, much, much the same for me as it was last year, too. I was like, I don't think they both needed to be there. And I thought Draymond was slightly more deserving than Clay was last year. Um, and it's really a push for me for this year. So I think Draymond's probably going to make it. You know, Clay probably makes it as well, too. But these are my picks, right? So I'm not putting Draymond. <laughs> you know, um, I'm not even going to put Clay, um, although I'm pretty sure he's going to make it. And I'm going to give those last couple of spots there, um, like I said, to Jokic. Uh, Damian Lillard, and then I would probably, even in this situation, although this is where it sucks because he hasn't played as many games, but this is where I'm going to break my own rule. I think Chris Paul has been an all-star for the Houston Rockets this year, so he'd be like the last uh, uh, last reserve pick I'd pick for that team. Wow, and that's pretty interesting. So just real quick, Shaw, what about the big cat, 20 and 12? I said, Carl, I said, I said, Carl, oh, yeah, you had, Carl Towns. You, oh, you, yeah. you had the big he's, cat in there, a, and, and what about LaMarcus mm-hmm. Aldridge? He's in there? Yep. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, my my initial my initial five, you know, okay. so like the two guards and three three uh, front court players is Westbrook Butler. Um, I got Lamarcus. I got the cat, um, and then I was throwing in Jokic there as instead of Draymond Green in that situation. Okay. But yeah, those, well, that's my those are my top five reserves. Oh, then you know we're symbiotic. We're like Siamese twins right about now because that's exactly where my I thought that to me the biggest trial and error that we would have to look at would be. The, the, the Damian Lillard scenario. Um, because again, what we're talking about here is teams that clearly have done more, um, especially with less. And in this particular case, it's hard to imagine not considering a guy like Damian Lillard to be a part of this roster, this all-star roster, uh, given the fact that the Portland Trailblazers are a winning basketball team. You know what? Like last year, Shaw, they were not completely a winning basketball team, not until later on. And maybe that had been held against him for that. Um, and in many other years, he's put up all-star-like type numbers, except that the team had not been holistically successful. And I just feel like here you have a situation where the numbers are not like all-world numbers. They're still Dame, Dollar, Dame, you know, Money Dame type numbers. And it's still not good enough because of the elevated play and the way that the all-star selection system has changed. I just hope he doesn't get snubbed. I would love to see him in the all-star uh, weekend. I just think he deserves it. And I, I just think it's, it's, it's high time, man, that if he doesn't get selected, that he just start naming names on his next album. That's just, that's just my take on this, man. I think, I think he's going to be safe. No, you know, no, no shots in four bar Friday are going to be necessary for Dame this year. I think he's pretty much solidified in there, especially with the team that's in the middle of the pack in the Western Conference going in there. Uh, coaches love to see a winner, if you will. And yeah, he's been banged up a little bit as well, too. But clearly, the, you know, he's the star, the, the straw that stirs the drink for in Portland. So he's the man. I think he'll be right there for All-Star Weekend in LA. All right. And how about you guys? Who do you think will be uh, the Eastern and Western Conference All-Star Reserve selections? We want to hear from you. Be sure to get at us at NBA Baseline. Cal Lee, Warren Shaw, the Baseline NBA Podcast. And this was The Drop. Coast to coast. Coast to coast. Time now to go coast to coast discussing the news in the association. You ready to run through the tape, Mr. Shaw? Absolutely, man. Let's ride. All right. Kemba Walker, George Hill, Rodney Hood. What they all got in common? Trade. Trade rumors. Look at all them rumors. Which one uh, sounds like they're going to shake up the, 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 the landscape of the NBA, Shaw? Yeah, I think uh, George Hill is, just has to go. Sacramento, too many veterans. We've talked about it numerous times on our show. Uh, so that makes the most sense. He's a guy who can help a team on both sides of basketball in addition to uh, providing a veteran presence. The Kemba Walker thing is crazy. He doesn't want to be traded. Uh, but they wanted to maybe look at at New York or maybe the New York team to see what they could maybe get back. And I think there could be some synergy there. Um, if the Knicks were willing to get rid of the, the Lakina, uh, maybe Kemba ends up at home and you know in you know in MSG, but I think of all those players, George Hill seems to be the safest bet to be moved. Rodney Hood is always hurt, so I don't know who's training for that guy. 
All right. Out in Boston, interesting little take. Kyrie Irving, after the loss to Celtics lose against the Orlando Magic, says, we need to learn to weather the storm. The Celtics have lost three straight games, Pelicans, Sixers, and Magic. Is this a blip on the radar, or is this growing pains that the Boston Celtics definitely need as they continue to be one of the top teams in the East? Uh, it's it's both. Um, you know, they, they are a very good basketball team. You know, they're going to hit these types of these these strides. Now they're going to go out west um, and see if they can kind of get some team bonding together on that on that trip. But they struggled to score the basketball again. Um, their defense hasn't really been as good as elite as, as lately as well, too. Just a lot of interior points in the paint that they're giving up. No rim protection. Um, and some guys are still banged up as well, too. So I think they'll be fine. But, you know, it's something that I don't think they can turn a blind eye at. They just got to put a little bit more effort into what they were doing like they were in the beginning of the season. All right, out in uh, California, yay, yay, yay. Ice Cube with another major announcement, the big three signing Kryptonite Nate Robinson. So does that mean that Nate's days of playing in the NBA are finally done? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure he's going to use it as a springboard, you know, try to get back in the league. So if he has a good showing in the summer, hoping that he can prove to some some GMs out there he can get a training inc- training camp invite. You know, I don't think he's giving up the NBA dream, but it'll be nice to see Nate out there. He's gonna like to pick three up, man. It's gonna be oh, you ridiculous. Talk about talking on on like yeah. ma- you know, gigantic proportions. Imagine him it's, yakety yakking with stack. But uh, you know what I'm saying? It's, Steph Jackson. It's gonna be unreal, man. They're gonna have to seriously have some microphones on these dudes when they ball. Yeah, if he's not the leading scorer or leading assist guy or whatever it is. He'll be the leading trash pointers. talker. Oh I my god. Mean, <laughs> Yeah, the big three is going to be Nate's for next season. So I think everybody should tune into that on Fox Sports 1, bro. All right. And uh, even though we're going to kind of add, you know, add our final news blip um, uh, on a somewhat somber note, sad note, I still think it's worth mentioning. The Boston Celtics losing one of the most prolific players in their family in JoJo White passed away, uh, you know, a few days ago, Shaw. Uh, I'm sure that the Celtics family is is impacted by this man. The accomplishments of JoJo White is just phenomenal. Played from 1970 to 1981, inducted into the Naismith Hall of Fame in 2015. Seven-time NBA All-Star, two-time NBA champion, two-time All NBA and NBA team, uh, All Rookie Team 69-70, 75-76 NBA Finals MVP. Inducted into the Missouri Hall of Fame, inducted into the Kansas Jayhawks Hall of Fame, inducted into the St. Louis Sports Hall of Fame, and one that I like to throw out there that doesn't often get mentioned just really about the type of person that he was he was also inducted into the marine corps sports hall of fame just an illustrious list of accolades for a man that i uh you know often praised and and talked about as being one of the more uh herald and not highly talked about boston celtic and jojo white yeah i mean i think you said a mouthful there for for a man who definitely impacted his community definitely impacted the game as well too and you know beloved by the Celtics community and the nba community at large so our prayers and condolences to, to, to his family and the whole NBA family. I think we are one. Uh, we'll definitely miss JoJo White, brother. All right. And once again, we'd like to offer our condolences to the White family. JoJo White passing away, uh, gone too soon, but will never be forgotten. Another awesome show, Shaw. What more can be said, man? We are riding high as we get a little bit close to NBA All-Star Weekend. Yes, sir. Like I said, it's been it's been a fun one. I, I love to reminisce and go over these these conversations. So hopefully our fans and listeners will will kind of tune in with us. We got some, you know, I didn't even talk about it at the time, but we got some feedback on Twitter. You know, a lot of people thought uh, the Timberwolves got the better end of of the Butler, or, sorry, of the of the Chicago trade there. Um, and then I think a lot of people thought uh, uh, the 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 Pacers actually got the better end of the Oladipo Sabonis Paul George thing as well too. So forgot to mention that in that part of our show. So thanks so much for giving us some feedback there on Twitter through our Twitter polls, man. We had a lot of fun doing that. We'll continue to kind of throw those tidbits out there when we know what our topics are going to be ahead of our show recording um, out there on Twitter. So make sure you follow us, give us a listen, and give us a hit, hit us up on all social medias and let us know how you feel about what we're discussing, man. Oh, I could have said it better myself, my brother. So for the baseline, Cali, Warren Shaw, we appreciate you guys, each and every single one of you, and we'll catch up with you next time.